everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I'm going to be doing my November reading wrap-up. I read a mix of thrillers and memoirs this month, and technically there's only one five-star book here, though there's one that I'm on the fence about. I gave it a four, and the jury's still out on whether it's a five-star read. Get ready, I definitely have feelings this month of confusion about how much I liked a certain book, but also some very firm uh, ideas about others that I didn't like quite as much. So let's dive right in. Starting with There's Something She's Not Telling Us by Darcy Bell. The name Darcy Bell might be familiar. She also wrote A Simple Favor, which was made into a major movie starring Blake Lively and Anna Kendrick. I have seen that movie multiple times, though I haven't read the book. It's this campy, ridiculous movie that is like, it's not good, technically, except I think it is good. I, I genuinely like it. So I was like, well, yeah, I'll read her next book. And this, too, was a campy, over-the-top suspense thriller, and I really enjoyed it. I gave it four stars. It's a really good read, but it's so soapy and ridiculous that... You have to really like that kind of read going into this one. And the reason I gave it four stars instead of five is that the ending really disappointed me. But what is this book about? So the main character, Charlotte, is a super anxious mom in New York. And I say this without reservation. I think this is the most anxious character POV I have ever read in a book, and it is incredibly effective. I felt so uncomfortable in her POV chapters, but also so seen in a horrible way. I mean, she's worse than I've ever been. But if that is the kind of thriller POV that you like, this one is incredibly well executed. Her POV is countered with the POV of Ruth. Ruth is the girlfriend of Charlotte's brother, and the whole setup is Charlotte returns from a trip to Mexico where you know shit went down with Ruth, you don't know what, and on the day they return, Charlotte has a huge client meeting for her florist business, like a cannot-be-missed meeting, and they want to have it at the time when she needs to be picking up her daughter from school, but she tries to go to the meeting and then rush to school to get her daughter a little bit late, but when she shows up, they say that her daughter has already been picked up, and she's like, what, what are you talking talking about. Well, Ruth has picked up her daughter from school and Charlotte immediately kicks off with accusations of kidnapping, that Ruth has kidnapped her daughter. Of course, because of the anxiety in her POV, you're not sure if Charlotte is just an overprotective mother, a bit of a helicopter mom, and you go back and forth in the past between Charlotte and Ruth's POV when they first met, as well as an entire section of the Mexico trip, and then finally back into the present at the end. This book was a ride. <laughs> As I said, it gets to really soapy heights. And to avoid further spoilers, just kind of based on that description, if that kind of setup sounds up your alley, plus the really soapy heights of an anxious heroine versus a possible kidnapper POV, then I do recommend this. I liked how ridiculous the book got. I do want to have a brief spoiler section where I talk about the end. Before I go into spoilers, I can generally say, as I said, the ending is basically, it's abrupt. It doesn't do that thing I personally really like in a good thriller, where after everything is resolved and you know all of the twists, or most of the twists, that the main character has a chance to kind of breathe and absorb what has happened, and you kind of skip ahead a little bit usually and get to see a snapshot of where the characters land after everything happens. And this book doesn't do that. It ends honestly pretty abruptly. I was on Kindle, and I got to what it turned out was the last page, and I tapped to the next one, and it was like the end, and I was like, excuse me? And I went backwards to check myself because I was sure something was wrong. So it had that kind of abrupt ending, which is what really ultimately dampened my enjoyment. Kind of sucks. If it had had a few more chapters, it would have been a five-star read for me. So now, briefly, spoilers, I do want to talk about the ending a bit more and essentially some loose ends that don't get tied up in the book that were hugely disappointing to me as a thriller reader. So if you're here and you've read the book, or if you just don't care about spoilers, that meeting that the mom goes to at the very beginning of the book, Charlotte, for her floral business, 
it turns out as you are reading, you realize it's the company that Ruth allegedly works for. The problem is you discover throughout the narrative that Ruth is a pathological liar and possibly has other personality defects. And so you're meant to question everything Ruth has ever said in her POV. And so this ends up with a few essentially dropped plots that I was just very disappointed as a reader not to have any kind of exciting resolution on because I was trying to like be with the narrative and make fun guesses and then it came to nothing. Specifically, you know that when Charlotte's brother goes to Ruth's office to surprise her with flowers that the security guard says that the company suddenly went out of business and that the ambulances came and there was a problem with food poisoning. Well, we also know from Ruth's POV that there was a whole thing with kale salad and also there's a thing generally with Ruth and cooking and so once you know that Ruth isn't all okay, it really begs the huge question, what did Ruth do to her coworkers? Because <laughs> I do believe that her coworkers were cruel to her, just not in the way that we get in her POV, because of course we know that she's probably a narcissist or a sociopath and definitely a pathological liar. But I do fully believe that Ruth would have taken revenge on her coworkers. So what happened? It annoys me that we never find out that whole thing. Is it true that the security guard was just new and that's that's why he said the company didn't exist and then but then said oh on that floor there was a problem what was the company ultimately did they really steal Ruth's idea I mean no way they did because she was but more importantly the weird coincidence that the meeting that Charlotte has in the, the very beginning of the book is with that company the exact company Ruth says that she worked for and the people in the scene seem to reflect some of the co-workers that Ruth also describes. So it's just like a big question mark that you're left with at the end of the book of, was that a coincidence? Did Ruth base her self delusion on this? But no, that doesn't make sense because the meeting came up after. So there are just a ton of questions and it feels like a real drop plot because the book ends so abruptly. Generally, I wanted far more unraveling of all of Ruth's lies or really her own self delusions. So that's where I landed on the book. I really enjoyed it. I was just disappointed ultimately with the follow through on the execution. Next, I read the book that really confused me, which is Sometimes I Lie by Alice Feeney. Not that I didn't understand the book. I understood the book. I just don't know how much I like it. <laughs> so on Goodreads, I ultimately gave it four stars. Like I wrote the review the, the night after I finished it. And I'm still kind of sitting with my feelings on this one. So right off the bat, I mean, literally from the title, you know that this is a fun, unreliable narrator novel. So there are three different POVs, so to speak, in the book. One is the main character, Amber, now. I mean, this takes place in 2016, but it is right after Christmas and Amber is in a coma. She's in a coma, but she can hear everything. She just can't move. The second POV is a week in the past. So it's everything that led up to Amber being hit by a car and ending up in a coma. In that section, you know that she's unhappy at work. She works for a radio program and her boss, who is the main personality on the radio, is a real B-I-T-C-H to her. And she's worried she's going to be fired because the host doesn't like her. And she's struggling a little bit in her marriage to her husband. He seems to be a little too close to her sister. So basically, Amber suspects that her sister Claire is having an affair with her husband. And then the third POV is a diary from 20 years ago, kind of going over this girl's childhood and her kind of re weird relationship with her parents. And so you jump between these three narratives. And it's really interesting because you know from the word jump that Amber as a narrator is unreliable because she flat out tells you that sometimes she lies. And there are things in the first, say, third of the book that you get to about the middle point and she finally admits, all right, I, I, I wasn't fully transparent about this. This is the truth but it means that you are on edge the whole time. It really colors the entire reading experience. And generally, this is a reading experience I like. I like unreliable narrators. The reason why I am conflicted. Okay, I kind of can't talk about this book without spoilers. I'm sorry this is such a heavy spoiler wrap up, but I'm labeling it, so skip. The good thing is I read this book because it's wildly popular. A ton of people recommended it, so I know many people have read it. So let's talk. Okay. Spoilers. 
So ultimately the reveal is that past and present Amber are Amber. So Amber was hit by a car, Amber is in a coma, but the past diary entries aren't Amber's, they are Claire's. And Claire is her adopted sister. So you realize as the diary entries go on that whomever this child is, she is seriously disturbed, she hates her parents, and ultimately kills them. It's pretty dark. She sets fire to their home. And you realize that the childhood friend who is described in the entries is Amber, just she had a different nickname. And so they became sisters after basically Claire killed her parents. And so the final showdown is Claire versus Amber because you're like, oh, Claire is psycho. But then there's final, final twists. So then <laughs> Amber murders Claire. <laughs> She does the same thing to Claire and her husband as Claire did to her parents. She turns the gas on and lets her die that way. And she takes her children. So meaning she has taken her children to safety and is going to raise them because there's a whole plot where like Amber had, uh, was pregnant and had a miscarriage because Claire caused her accident. I'm just talking in circles. If you've already read it, you already know all this. Like basically Claire put Amber in a coma because Claire thought that Amber was gonna tell on Claire for what Claire did, whole thing going on. And then the final, final, final twist is that you realize in the diaries, as cray cray as Claire was, that there's this line that says, Taylor told me to do it, which was Amber's nickname. And so especially given Amber basically murders Claire and her husband and takes her children, that they're both sociopathic people. And but it does beg all sorts of questions. Chicken and egg was were they both always sociopaths? Did they just, you know, bounce off each other? Did Claire make Amber worse? Like, did she bring out the worst in her, especially because she basically stole her family from her? I, it was so tragic that Amber's parents ultimately loved Claire more. That was really painful. <laughs> and to that end, I found the characters really, really compelling, but I mean, we're in the spoiler section. I'm talking about why I'm not sure how I feel about this book. If you've read it, you understand this. If you haven't and you're listening to me rambling about these spoilers, you're like, what the hell goes on in this book? This book throws the kitchen sink at the reader at the end, and this is why I'm conflicted. I am not sure if this book is brilliant, a master class in unreliable narrators and twists upon twists upon twists, because there's also an indication at the very end of the book, oh God, I didn't even mention Amber Stalker. So much going on in this book. Oh God, and the whole thing with her boss is the aunt who stole Claire's home. There's so much that goes on in this book. If you've read it, you know. And there's an indication that someone's alive at the end who knows what Amber did. And you don't know if it's the guy who was stalking her who she didn't successfully kill or if it's Claire because you never quite get confirmation. Like the last time Amber saw her, she was dying but not dead. I don't know which ending I, I like better or choose to believe, but either way, I can't decide whether this is a brilliant five-star book because what? Or if it's actually a three because throwing the kitchen sink at the reader is that skill or is that throwing so much at the reader that you bamboozle them into thinking that it's brilliant and I honestly don't know where I fall on it. I need more time to sit with it. I read this book three and a half weeks ago and I've just been kind of unsure. We're gonna end spoilers there. So I settled on a four. I thought it was fair to fall in the middle. Not sure if this is a five-star masterpiece or a three-star, huh? So I settled on a four because clearly I enjoyed the reading experience and this book gave me feelings. I mean, I'm, I just don't know what to think. This is one, if you've read it, because a lot of people have read it, down below in the comments. Like, what did you think? But do label your comments with spoilers for this book. I just, don't know what I think, which could be the mark of a great book. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I thought I would know by the time I filmed this video, but I don't. That said, of all the books that I read this month, it's one of the standouts in terms of like being very sticky. Like I remember a weird amount of it, which is always a really good sign. So we'll see.
Next, I read Mr. Nobody by Katherine Stedman. I gave this one four stars. This one is going to be good if you like... It felt like almost procedural in a way, but it's not. It's not a cop investigating. It is a medical professional, which is actually kind of refreshing. So it hit, hit some beats that you're gonna get in like a cu buddy cop kind of thriller, which normally isn't my thing like detective thrillers, but without it actually being detectives. And if you like amnesia plots. So the plot on this one is the main character, Emma, is a leading, like, she has a special title, but the long story short is her specialization is memory loss, amnesia, and fugues. And fugues are incredibly rare, and she's actually written papers saying that she thinks that the science that preceded her and the experts in the field uh, were false in some of their diagnoses of people. They had said that people were faking a fugue, and she was like, well, if you ran this test, you would have been able to prove or disprove it. Like, this is a real ph phenomenon, though incredibly rare. But she's young and she's hungry and she wants to prove herself. And so this case comes to her. This man has washed up on a beach and he cannot remember anything about who he is. And so she is called in as the expert. But the catch is this is in her old hometown that she left in a blaze of glory 14 years ago. Like something so bad happened that she and her entire family basically had to enter witness protection and change their name. So her name is not actually Emma. It is now, but her original name. And as you're reading, she decides to go. You're also piecing together what happened to her and her family 14 years ago to cause her to leave town. And she's also interacting with this amnesia patient. And you do get her chapters are first person and then you get chapters from it's it's his pov it they're all labeled the man but it's third person and it does jump around so in his chapters you're getting his perspective also of his nurse and a few of the cops so you get a couple of these third person little snippets but it's primarily emma's story and it's that thing of you the reader being like how how is he connected to her because when she first meets him he knows her real name so that is kind of the unraveling of the suspense in this one I picked this one up because her previous book was selected for Reese's Book Club, and if you've watched my videos before, you know that I know the person who picks those books and I trust her taste. And indeed, Katherine Stedman is a really good writer. I just liked her writing style, which helped a lot. And fun fact, she's an actress. Like, I looked her up and, like, it was like she was on Downton Abbey. Like, so it's kind of cool. She's an actress who also writes quite good books. Ultimately, the reason I gave this four instead of five stars is that the book really fell down on the final hurdle for me. There were a series of things in the third act that I'm not going to go into detail on that I once we got there, like it was supported by the text. It just wasn't really what I expected or wanted. And so this is a me thing. This is me bringing certain expectations to the book. I think the problem there is I was following the breadcrumbs and the clues and really meeting the book where it was at in the first two thirds. It feels very grounded. Then in the final third, instead of doing what I thought it was going to do, which in fairness would have also been really soapy, it does a different kind of soapy twist. It just really stretched my suspension of disbelief, I, I suppose is the way to put it. It's mostly that I was expecting something else and so I didn't get what I thought I wanted and so I enjoyed enjoyed the last third just a little bit less. There's also a romantic entanglement in the book, though it's not romance heavy, so I'd say if you prefer your suspense with less romance, this is a good pick for you. And that romance basically at the end, once everything has resolved, this does have a nice resolution, like you get a couple chapters after everything happens. Um, so you get a happily ever after, but I wasn't invested enough in the romance because it isn't developed enough in the story. It's the catch 22. If you don't really care for romance in your suspense novels, this definitely doesn't have a ton of it. But then at the end, you're meant to attach to a happy ending that isn't supported in the text. So I wish there had been a bit more of a romantic thread that could have really helped this be five stars for me. But ultimately, for me, it's the way that kind of the twists resolve themselves in the third act that just didn't quite meet my expectations. I will say that the twist involving Emma's past and her family's secret was really good, and that's actually part of the problem with the ending. I thought that that reveal, which happens about in the middle, was so strong in terms of character development and intrigue that it wasn't adequately followed up on in the last part of the book. 
Next, I read two memoirs, again with Kindle Unlimited. First, I read My Mother Was Nuts by Penny Marshall, and then I read It's Not Easy Being Me by Rodney Dangerfield. If you are a younger viewer, you might be going, who? But I'm just the right age to barely know who they are, like enough. A League of Their Own is one of my favorite movies and Penny Marshall directed that, and Rodney Dangerfield was in a series of movies as I was coming of age, specifically the, in hindsight, really problematic movie Ladybugs. Yeah. Anyway, they felt free on Kindle Unlimited and memoirs are fast reads, so I read both of them. Indeed, 24 hours or less for both of them. Starting with Penny Marshall's memoir, it was a solid read. It was well written, though in the case of both of these, and I'm starting to find like a pattern, I think I got lucky with some of the memoirs I read years ago where they were actually written by the stars, and right now I'm on a kick of ones that were clearly dictated to a writer with varying levels of success. So both of these had problems where some of the anecdotes were so short and a little bit choppy and disconnected from the larger narrative because it's clear that the writer of the book, the actual writer, is taking transcripts of talking to these two people and trying to string things together. Not quite as bad with Penny Marshall's book, which I gave a solid four stars. You basically move chronologically through her life, starting in young childhood through to her career. And the memoirs, uh, not quite 10 years old, she has passed away since then, but it was basically written toward the end of her life slash career. Though it's always depressing when you get to the end of a book like that and go, oh, she couldn't have known she was gonna die soon. How depressing. What's interesting about Penny Marshall's is she really knew the biggest names in comedy, and it, there's a lot of name dropping in it, both good and bad. She was also best friends with Carrie Fisher and dated Art Garfunkel, things I didn't know about Penny Marshall, so that was a good read. This is weird. My one problem I had with her memoir is so... I think this begs the question that when you're reading a memoir of someone else's life, how much does your own personal judgment of choices they made in their life inform how you enjoy their book. Is it really fair to say that you liked a book less because you didn't like some a choice they made in their life? I mean, I guess when you're talking about your life, that's a question that's food for thought. And so what was weird for me reading her memoir, it's called My Mother Was Nuts, and she talks a lot about her, her mother, who was apparently nuts, but who was very instrumental in terms of like shaping Penny's life. But the irony is, I really didn't care for Penny Marshall as a mother. And she even admits in the narrative once or twice that she wasn't the greatest mom, but is then not self-reflective in a ton of other passages. What I kept coming back to throughout the book as she talks about this incredible career she had, she had that incredible career because she walked down on her kid. She got pregnant young, she got pregnant in college and had to drop out and she had this kid. And the way she phrases it is her mother and her husband's mother took the baby from them. They're like, we want to raise her. It's interesting the way it's phrased and it feels like a little bit revisionist because she's telling the story. But regardless, before her daughter even became a toddler, she moved to Los Angeles. And then her daughter didn't come to live with her until she was in her like early tweens. The, the point is, her daughter was in a league of their own, by the way. She was briefly an actress. It's really strange reading about this whole thing from Penny's point of view, especially a large part of the book, the part where she's best friends with Carrie Fisher and it's the 80s and she's in her 40s and she's doing a lot of drugs and traveling the world. I mean, have fun, but how she says more than once that the reason she did drugs and had so much fun and partied in the 80s when she was older is because her 20s were taken away from her. And where I was just like feeling judgmental as a reader is that I'm sitting here like, what do you mean? You weren't even a parent to your child for two years and you had her when you were about 20 years old, which means you actually got the majority of your 20s, which is when you moved to LA and dated and married Rob Reiner and started acting and were doing all these fun things in Los Angeles without your child. So it definitely felt a little revisionist. Uh, very, <sighs> It made me kind of uncomfortable because I just, all I kept thinking was, how does Tracy Reiner see her life and her history? What's her perspective on this story? Even if she loves her mother dearly, she must have feelings about her life and her upbringing. Uh, so ultimately, 
I just kept coming back to that point of judgment, whether that's fair or unfair. I thought it was a little... It's really fascinating reading a memoir because someone writes their own story and seeing their own blind spots about their own life. And I really felt that, that was a blind spot for Penny Marshall. She could admit she wasn't the best mom and yet was making excuses for why she really wasn't parenting her daughter. Uh, while also saying like, like it would be like, oh, and Tracy came to live with us. And then you get a bunch of stories about how hard she was parting. And it's like, were you raising her at all? Did that all fall on your husband? Which is probably why Tracy is still a Reiner, even though her mother was only married to him for like less than 10 years. Ugh, now I'm speculating, which I feel bad about. Anyway, I also had problems with Rodney Dangerfield's memoir. Penny Marshall was at least pretty candid about her personal life. Like, I feel like I know a good deal about her marriages and her children, which is kind of voyeuristic in its own way. But Rodney Dangerfield is the polar opposite. If you want to know how Rodney Dangerfield became super famous, that is what you get in his memoir. It is point for point, with very little actual vulnerability or personal reflection. And it started to feel weird. It wasn't bad. Also, the anecdotes in Dangerfield's book are so short. Sometimes it's like two paragraphs and then you move on. So it actually feels, I say anecdotes, they really feel in many cases like just a series of jokes, a series of storytelling jokes. And what's in between each of these little jokes is a joke. That's how they separate all the sections. They literally have one of his set up punchline jokes, like they're throughout the book. So you can read a lot of his material. And some of it was interesting. And a lot of it fell flat for me. Just especially a lot of the anecdotes were name dropping people from comedy from like the 50s and 60s who I've never heard of. And he even had a few like little stories that were definitely meant to be like, I had black friends. There was literally one of those where you're like, why did you tell that story other than to let us know that you were friends with a black comedian in the 40s? Like, but the, my biggest thing was he briefly mentions his kids, including that he opened a club in New York so that he could stop touring on the road to take care of his kids, to raise his kids. And yet there's nothing actually in there about his kids. I know nothing about his children, which is partly maybe he's protecting their privacy, but partly weird in a memoir. You expect there to be more about fatherhood and blah, 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 blah. But also importantly, he really skims over his romantic relationships. And yet almost all of his jokes, like a massive amount of his material is based in relationships, sex, marriage, tons of wife jokes, including, I mean, really a huge thing in his shtick was being unhappy in his marriage and inadequate in bed. That was part of the humor, can't get no respect. Um, so it was very weird. He was married to his first wife twice. They were married for a, a nice chunk of years. Uh, and then they got divorced and then got remarried less than a year later and had their kids. And like all told, he was with this woman for 20 or 30 years. And all we know about her is that they didn't really get along. That's it. So it felt very thin on those kind of personal details. And so ultimately his memoir is how I became famous with a lot of jokes. And it was fine. I just kind of gave it a lukewarm three stars. If you don't know who Rodney Dangerfield is, don't bother. Um, Cause I also, actually this part was fascinating. If you are interested in comedy and the history of comedy, it's a snapshot into what comedy used to be like. Comedy has changed so much. And that was my biggest takeaway realizing, huh, his jokes, his comedy was all set up punchline, a lot of kind of, a lot of humor that you can't get away with now for better or for worse, a lot of misogyny, but like, I'm not mad about it. That's just a statement of fact. Um, cause now we have more story based comedy. Um, it's, it's more about who the comedian is and like, you know, the comedian and they're, uh, you know, you build a story to, to, to a punchline at the end. And Rodney Dangerfield just didn't do that kind of comedy, which is probably why there's so little per actual personal information in his memoir, because that he, he, that wasn't who he was as a comedian. It was the really funny self-deprecating joke about the terrible wife or being bad in bed. But does that even reflect reality? I don't know, because he doesn't actually let us into that kind of part of himself. So it's ultimately a how a famous comedian became famous story and not much else. 
Then I read Queen of Nothing. I read it on a plane to Thanksgiving. It was a perfect plane read. I almost finished it on the plane and then I finished it that night. Though I will say, okay, this one ultimately, I've decided is four stars. Hear me out, stands. Although frankly, you can be a stand and agree with me because I love this series. The Cruel Prince and the Wicked King were like breaths of fresh air for me. They, The Cruel Prince especially, it was the first YA fantasy that I'd been consumed by in a long time at the time that I read it. And then if you've heard me talk about The Wicked King before, I believe... Well, my feeling at the time that I read The Wicked King is that we were in store for a perfect trilogy. I think this is a less than perfect trilogy, but more perfect than most Y trilogies that have come before. Because what I still really, really like about the trilogy as a whole is that The Cruel Prince is a complete twisty story. The Wicked King is a complete twisty story. The thing with book three is that it's not a complete twisty story in that it doesn't stand alone but it perfectly ties up everything that came in book one and two. And the thing that I don't like often in trilogies, especially we've seen in this and YA in the past, I, is when you have book one as a complete standalone twisty story, and then book two is a bridge book that just is literally a bridge to book three, where the author then jam packs book three with a great twisty complete story. But as a reader, it's kind of like book two ends up being eh. And that's even if you make it to book three, because what sucks about a disappointing book two, when book two is basically so thin that it doesn't have enough story to support itself, is are you even going to pick up book three? So this is in its own way much better. So book three, Queen of Nothing, ties up all our loose ends. And it does, of course, have its own story. It just wasn't quite as meaty as the first two. And there's one thing that bothered me about it. Again, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have a spoiler discussion. So non-spoilery, I'll say, there's one thing that the book does in setup with a character from the first two books who was a significant conflict driver in the first two books where I was just disappointed with what happened with this character and that storyline. It was a bit of a letdown. And I feel that if there'd been a slight tweak to how this character and plotline was treated, book three could have been a meteor book. But at the same time, I'm like, this is the book we have. And it gave me everything I wanted. It wrapped up the romance and plot threads and character conflicts between characters. But, but, but. Okay, so now we're going to talk about spoilers. <laughs> okay, a lot of you have read this, so. Locke. Locke and Taryn, actually. The, the, the problem, they, they go together. Ultimately, I'm kind of disappointed that Locke dies off screen, that Taryn killed him, and that Taryn just shows up at the beginning of the book and it's like, I'm so sorry, sister, I need your help. And it like immediately resolves not only the conflict between the sisters, but also resolves this significant antagonist for Jude from books one and two. And it frustrates me and it feels like it really robbed Jude of agency that she wasn't able to confront Locke in any way in book three or do anything about him. And as a reader, when I was reading The Wicked King specifically, I was looking forward to a big showdown in book three. I was expecting it. That said, I liked the character development aspect of Taryn killing Locke, but it happens off page. It's basically like something that we are informed happened before this book started. And I know that by the time you get to book three, you don't want to have that cheap character device, that thing that authors do when they get desperate and write themselves into a corner where you suddenly add a POV. I'm glad Holly Black didn't do that. And yet a part of me is like, even if Jude didn't get to kill Locke, I would have wanted, I don't know, Taryn's point of view, which would have solved an ongoing problem with Taryn, period, in this series. I will say I love this series, and yet I think Taryn is the most underserved character in it. There are attempts to serve her in, the, in all three, actually, but because we get only Jude's POV and how Jude sees her sister, it was always going to be lacking. Taryn was always not quite going to feel like a complete person with her own kind of arc and agency. And so I'm just a little frustrated that we didn't get to see the character development in Taryn and the turn that led to this. I mean, she murdered someone and hid the body. 
it's kind of baller. I kind of respect her. So that is probably my biggest letdown. I think it was a real opportunity lost in book three. And I mean, it's about a hundred pages shorter than it could have been. Like, it's a short book. It is not that long, which on the one hand, thank you, but on the other hand, could have comfortably had uh, some more subplots in it, essentially, to complicate the narrative a bit more and make it a more complete story. So that's kind of my feeling there. I'm not going to quibble with the rest of it. I, I've heard that people do have quibbles with some of the other things in the book, but that was my only personal one that I felt a little robbed as a reader who's like invested in this series with the resolutions when it came to Locke and Taryn. I was satisfied with most of the other character resolutions. So that was kind of, I, I guess also so much attention paid to Vivi and Vivi's happy ending, which I'm happy for her, but Taryn should have been the stronger character. Twins! You have twins! And I just feel like it wasn't, uh, it didn't reach its full potential for me as a reader. So yeah. Um, but, and spoilers, I loved it. And in fact, when I first reviewed it on Goodreads, I did give it five stars, but I've decided it really should be four stars because I think if giving it also five stars takes away from the first two books, which are unequivocal five star reads. So that's why I've settled on a four star rating for this one. Again, mark your comments with spoilers, but let's talk about feelings about Queen of Nothing in the comments because oh, I, I mean, it's a satisfying conclusion to the series, just with tiny quibbles. Next, I read The Secrets They Left Behind by Lissa Marie Redmond. This is an adult thriller about a 23-year-old cop from Buffalo who is recruited by the FBI to pose undercover as an 18-year-old in order to get to the bottom of a missing girl's case. Three girls in a small town of Kelly's Falls disappeared around Christmas, just out of nowhere, and it's February into March now, and they just don't have any leads. So they want to bring the main character, Shay, in to pose as a student to basically get the kids to talk to her. We also know that Shay has done this previously. This is not the first time that the FBI has taken advantage of her baby face and had her pose as a student. The last time she posed as a high school student in a serial killer case and has ended up with some PTSD. As soon as she arrives in Kelly's Falls, she already meets opposition. It's a one sheriff town and he does not want her there. He feels that he is being threatened because he hasn't solved the case, but she's posing as his niece and living in a boarding house. And she makes friends with one of the missing girl's cousins and then has romantic tension with one of the missing girl's brothers. Or brother, singular, she has only one. So it is, part like undercover it has hints of a like a procedural like a detective thriller fiction but it also is pretty heavy on romance this is an odd one it because she's posing as an 18 year old so she's hanging around with 18 year olds who are freshmen in community college it has almost a YA crossover feel but okay i gave this one a, a very middle of the road 3.5 stars I had some issues with this book and what actually ended up being interesting for me, this happens sometimes. I found myself reading it like a writer a lot of the time where there would be sections where something was unsettling for me. Like I wasn't sitting right with something and I put my writer hat on and, and figure out why. So ultimately it's a 3.5 for me because I like the tropes. I like the setup. I like small town secrets. I like kind of missing girls. I like the undercover cop thing because I like kind of secret secret identities where you're pretending to be something you're not. I like the inherent conflict that comes with that. And there are some great moments of tension in this book where the, you know, this, this girl, this woman has to pretend to be a girl and she's lying to people who she quite likes. But ultimately, I think the book's main problem for me as a reader, there were some issues with the characters. There was a bit of character soup. So we have three missing girls and we get one chapter from the POV of one of them. It's a prologue before they go missing. Like it's the moment before something happens to them. So you get a little bit of context about where they were before they disappeared but you don't really get to know them. It's honestly really hard to have a reader get to know characters who are no longer there. This is kind of helped by having one of the characters' cousins and then also her brother. So 
The problem here is it's a trio of girls and we get a lot of details about two of them and almost nothing about the third one. Like from a personality standpoint, she doesn't just have a lot going for her. As a reader, like she was quiet. So it makes her hard to remember. And I'll talk about spoilers again. I'm gonna talk about spoilers for this book. It's gonna come up later as important. And then also when Shay moves to town, she befriends three more girls. We have three more teenage girls that we're supposed to keep track of. All these girls have really similar current kind of Gen Z names as well, which doesn't help. And same thing, the main girl that Shay interacts with is Kayla, who is the cousin of one of the missing girls. And she is decently distinct, but the other two, I only remember one of their names, Jenna, and the only way to tell them apart is one of them is hot for the boy that Shay ends up dating and the other one isn't. That's the only difference between them. They're just kind of stereotypical teen girls at college who go to parties and like boys. That's, that's what they are. Uh, and then there are a couple of stereotypical tropey boy characters like, oh, the hot guy, and like the bad boy. The I guess the bad boy's a little characterized because of course he's also a drag dealer, because why not? And he's the ex-boyfriend of one of the missing girls. But I found it tricky to latch on to a lot of these characters and like really dig my teeth into them, remember who they were. Just too many of these characters didn't feel exactly distinct. And then my issue with Shay, I actually liked her as a character, except, okay, she neither felt like a 23 year old nor a t an 18 year old. So she didn't quite feel like a 23 year old and then didn't quite feel like a 23 year old pretending to be an 18 year old. She felt a little older at times. The, like the main thing that kind of pinged me later on in the book was she has this, her whole thing is that she has to, she has to solve this for the girls. She's doing it for the girls. And I don't know about you, but personally, when I was t around 23 years old, so she's only about a year out of college, I thought of 18, 19 year olds as my peers, not as girls. I didn't have a motherly or mentorly affection for kids people who were only a few years younger than I was. They were peers. And so she's almost mentally or motherly about them like an older character would be. If this character was in her 30s, it, that would make a lot more sense to me. But for the narrative to work, she has to be 23. And she felt a little too mature to be 23 for me at times. The other thing that just didn't work for me in the book so the romance is about 50% of the narrative. So the, there's a whole thread of Shay being romantically involved with Nick, who is the brother of one of the missing girls. Now this is the suspense trope. I was expecting this. I was like, she's either going to be romantically involved in the sheriff or the brother or both. And they didn't go with the sheriff, they went with the brother. And you know that in suspense and tropes, this is because you're gonna have that moment where she suspects the person she's sleeping with. This is normal. But it basically is half romance because a firm half of the happy ending of this book is the romance working out. And the problem is, is that I didn't like the romance. I am a romance reader. I like romance, but the book had some very regressive gender stereotypes, regressive misogynist models. I know, and you're like, oh, what a joyless feminist. Sure. But the thing that bugged me, so Shay is a cop. She's 23 years old. She's, and she's, she's fought her way to have this job and she wants to prove herself. She's a pretty tough character. And even though she has some PTSD from the last case she did, and you find out more about it that I won't spoil. I mean, she did a damn good job in that last case. Like she solved a serial murder case. So she's gotta be a little tough, right? And if she's 23, she was born in the late nineties. And Nick, the boyfriend character is 21. And there are just these few moments in this book where he swings suddenly into aggressive, jealous, alpha male territory. There is a scene, this is a little spoilery, but not majorly spoilery, where there is a character, a male character, who essentially assaults Shay. He corners her somewhere, like pushes her against a wall and gets really close to her and he's like whispering in her ear. He's being, a, he's trying to intimidate and threaten her. And Nick, of course, walks in and sees it. And he blows his lid. He thinks that they were making out and he starts screaming at her, like saying really awful things. And my problem here was, I don't like that he did it at all. It's really not a good look, the jealousy. Uh, and they've only been like, they've only been on two dates at that point. She's only been there for like a week. My problem was her reaction. She runs after him crying, 
begging him, begging him to take her back. She doesn't even tell him that she was just assaulted. Or she doesn't call him on his aggressive, macho, jealous bullshit. And I'm like, this guy is bad news. So honestly, that scene ruined his character for me. Before then, he was kind of a nice guy. Not nice guy, capital N, capital G, though I guess that's what he turned out to be. He was kind of like the cuddly, sweet brother who really missed his sister. And I liked him as a character before that, and then I hated him after that, and I checked out completely uh, of the romance arc, and then the romance arc ended up being important. So that's why I just couldn't quite enjoy this book. But I promised you spoilers. This video is going to be way too long. Okay, spoilers. Okay, so my biggest problem with this book, honestly, is that it was predictable to the point of being upsetting. And that is because the bad guy was so clearly telegraphed from page one of his appearance that I, it's a problem in the writing. Now we are suspense readers, we are thriller readers, we read to try to get ahead of, of the narratives, but it shouldn't be this obvious. This, this, essentially, the character of the sheriff, who is of course the bad guy, as soon as, you probably might have thought it too, oh the sheriff doesn't want her in town, oh I forgot this detail, he's immediately introduced as being 38, really handsome, and the most eligible eligible bachelor in town and immediately it's like ding 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 likes to screw teenage girls that's where my head went and the author's job there should be to red herring me the job should be to build this character as really charming and make him seem harmless and chivalrous and that you start you should be doubting that this man had a sexual relationship with a teenager and then murdered three of them and that's not what happens um he is an incredibly inconsistent character. He gets angry and aggressive with Shay as the plot needs it. The, I could tell that there were moments where she was like, oh, I need them to have a little bit of conflict. And in a single scene, they would go from having a normal conversation where you're like, oh, this guy might be normal, but it might not be him, to him being psycho. And then it was like, no, no, it's definitely him because why is he acting this way with her? And it was a little bit too obvious. And it kind of killed the suspense part of the book because I wasn't held in suspense because it was really, really obvious that it was him and that he was unhappy with her being there because it was him. And so I just wish the book had worked a little harder to hide, hide the seams and it didn't. Um, so that was really disappointing because then the only other thing holding up the book is the romance, which I didn't like. If I liked the romance more, I could have forgiven the ham-fisted villain depiction, basically. But honestly, ideally, why not both? Why can't you have a dynamic bad guy who hides in plain sight? Because he's got to be a sociopath if he's killing girls. It's indicated he's done this before. So he should be a lot more charming and better at hiding than he was. Like, I'm fine with a big villain turn at the end, but don't have him exploding in temper from the first scene that he's in, because it's just way too obvious. Um, and so to that end, like, there were good red herrings. Um, and yeah, mostly I'm still mad about the romance. Like, Nick Nick is not cool. He, he's, he's a douche. So I couldn't support the romance. And ultimately, I guess that means Shay was a little bit inconsistent as well. Like, I know that there are women who put up with abuse, but then don't have that be end game. Like, at the end, I'm meant to believe this is some, like, true love thing. And I'm like, okay, so maybe she had PTSD. And, like, there, there's a, a line that says damage attracts damage. And, and I'm like, okay, but then don't have that be a happy ending. Like, if, he's, if Nick is going to be a jealous, abusive boyfriend, like, don't gaslight me. So, and spoilers. So that was kind of disappointing. I'm not saying don't read it. If you really like the tropes, you might like it. And hopefully you didn't just watch the spoiler section to ruin the book. Um, but for me, I need the suspense portion to be a little twistier and I need the romance to not have garbage in it, so. And last but not least, I read One of Us is Next by Karen McManus. So this is the sequel to One of Us is Lying. I was thrilled to get a copy of an arc from a friend of mine. Five stars. So fans of One of Us is Lying will probably love this book. 
I can't see people who loved that book not loving this book. It delivers everything I expected it to deliver and more. So, so first of all, you get a lot of appearances from the characters in the first book, including the shipping that you all know and love. There is a lot of Bronwyn and Nate in it, partly because Maeve, Bronwyn's younger sister, is one of the POV characters. Addie is there, and then Cooper is there the least. He definitely makes the fewest appearances, but you do know that he is happy where he is. I'll say that Personally, I didn't need quite as much of the fan service, but it was there for the fans, so fans will be pleased. But happily, my favorite thing about the book is that it does stand on its own with new characters and a new mystery. I was worried it would be a little bit regressive, and it's not. I thought that the mystery, which I'm not going to say too much about because I don't want to spoil anyone's read, I was very pleased with where it went. So the basic setup is we have three new POV characters, Maeve, Bronwyn's younger sister, Knox, who is her best friend and ex-boyfriend, and Phoebe, who is a classmate of theirs, also a waitress at a restaurant where they all hang out. Kind of a common thread is Cafe Contiga, which is owned by Lewis's dad, Lewis from the first book, and Maeve has a crush on him. So all the different ways that these characters from the last book are tied in. And it's only been 18 months since the events of One of Us is Lying. And since that took place halfway through senior year, that means the characters from One of Us is Lying, they are only in the second half of their freshman years at college, if they are at college, and thus Maeve and her friends are juniors. So someone kicks off a truth or dare game. It's a text game where someone will get a text that says, you know, Maeve, truth or dare, and that person has 24 hours to either pick truth or a dare. And if you don't respond, it defaults to truth. The truth is a horrible secret that the person probably doesn't want getting out, and the dare is mostly high school pranks. So the person playing the game is like, always take the dare. You don't want your secrets coming out. So the first person on the chopping block is Phoebe. So the book kicks off with a terrible secret of hers coming out, and then it kind of goes from there. There's a couple of dares, and then it's Maeve's turn, and there's drama there. Again, I don't want to give any spoilers, and it escalates. And you, as the reader, knows, in addition to these three POVs, you get little snippets from a forum on Reddit that is a continuation of the revenge forum that Simon frequented. So you know that there are people on this revenge forum who are targeting Bayview, and then you also get a little glimpse into the future. It's transcripts from news reports because you know that about two weeks in the future, there is a Bayview student who dies. And so you're reading up to the point that the student dies. Happens around the midpoint. And as much as I enjoyed the buildup with Truth or Dare, because it's just the kind of like high school stakes that I enjoy, the death is really good the twist, the midpoint turn, I was hooked from that point on. I, I mean, I read the book quickly anyway, a little, little more than 24 hours, but particularly once I got to the midpoint, I couldn't stop reading. So ultimately, as I said, yeah, very satisfying suspense read and very satisfying from a character point of view. You're getting glimpses of the characters that you loved in the first one, and I really liked the new characters. And honestly, with no disrespect to Maeve, I actually like the new characters best, more than Maeve. So Phoebe and Knox, I just really liked their POVs, possibly just because it was something new. Because we already knew so much about Maeve and her family through Bronwyn's POV, the book doesn't do too much on that side. Maeve's main storylines are more personal and character-based, and then Phoebe and Knox have their personal character-based storylines tie into the suspense plot a little more. So I found them particularly engaging because you were getting some really good clues from their POVs about what was going on. Uh, Maeve is definitely, I feel, a bridge character in this book. She's there because she's the most familiar from the first book and ties ties everyone together to the first book. But for me, I really liked Phoebe and Max's POVs a lot. So yeah, if you're a fan of the first one, definitely pick this one up. And 
Honestly, you could read this without having read One of Us is Lying if you just never got to it or you were spoiled for it like I did and didn't decide to read it. Uh, or even if it wasn't completely your cup of tea, I honestly think this book is worth giving a go because it can stand alone. You just might care a little less for the appearances of the characters from the first book because you won't have all of the context, but there's enough kind of meat there. And then the mystery plot definitely stands on its own that I think you can read this whether you loved the first book or didn't. But I do think if you love the first book, you'll probably love this. It's very satisfying in terms of what it delivers. So those are all the books that I read in November. As always, I'm sorry this is so long, but oh, I had so much to say about so many of these, especially spoilers. I think this is the most spoilers I've ever done in a wrap-up video, but nicely labeled so you can skip around them. Um, Because ultimately, with so many of the books that I read, it really is all about the ending and how it kind of ties together. So this was an interesting month because I read books with very interesting premises and executions, but more than one of them definitely fell down on the landing. So that was interesting. As always, Give this video a thumbs up if you like it and I mean I'm gonna keep reading and I'm gonna keep doing wrap up so I make these long for my book fam too so if you're not already subscribed to the channel go ahead and do that I post new videos two to three times a week thank you so much for watching and as always happy reading